hello everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for coming to my presentation. Also, thank you, uh, Rafael, to inviting me to, for inviting me to this uh, session. Uh, my name is Hamed Riai. I'm an assistant professor of economics at the OSF Business School in Paris campus. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, my paper entitled Housing, the Credit Market and Unconventional Monetary Policies from the Sovereign Crisis to the Great Lockdown. Uh, I wish you a Happy New Year at the beginning of the, of the presentation. I hope that uh, 2021 is a better year than 2020. And we can finish with all this story of COVID-19 and uh, economic recession and also the lockdown that we have. <laughs> we see every day actually, in, especially in, in Europe. Uh, before starting the, the presentation, I should just mention that this uh, work is in uh, the work in uh, 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 work in progress. So any suggestion or any uh, any comments are uh, highly welcome. And also, I should mention that uh, in this uh, presentation, I because we have uh, uh, online presentation, I try to keep the presentation as simple as possible. Uh, there are more details in the paper. There are more questions which are answered in the, in, the, in the paper with more details. So if you have time, please take a look and please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any suggestion or you have any point that you think it, it could be improved actually in the, in the future version. So now I start the, the presentation. Uh, the main theme of, of or the main uh, subject of this paper is about um, the interaction between the housing and unconventional monetary policies, especially the, the, the QE. Uh, there are lots of there are papers about the empirical papers about housing and unconventional monetary policies, but there are not uh, lots of paper who which, which uh, talks uh, specifically about uh, the housing and unconventional monetary policies through theoretical models or the DSG models, the dynamic general equilibrium models. So, actually, in this paper, first I and, and this, this presentation and this paper, the first chapter is about. Uh, the, in, the, in the monetary union, how do housing and credit market contribute to the economy in the time of crisis? And when we answer to this one in the second chapter, I uh, try to focus more on the housing and the interaction between housing and unconventional monetary policies. And to answer actually these two questions, I uh, put these two strands of literature, put two strands of literature together. The first one is the crisis literature with the focus on the financial sector, that we have plenty of them after 2008 uh, financial crisis, and also the housing literature that the Viacovelo 2008, 2005, and uh, 15, or Rubio's work that they uh, look at the different aspects of, of, the, of the housing market. So I actually developed a, a two country model of the monetary union based on the Ores and others uh, 2018, uh, that is, uh, which, which is a, a, a European Economic Association, uh, European Economic Reviews paper, uh, that actually in this, this um, model, this, this paper is based on Gerter Karadi 2011, 2011, that I think all of us know that one. And that actually, I just, if I briefly want to talk about data, the data model, they have a two country model, the core and periphery country. And uh, the only change that they did actually to Gerter Karadi, they imposed um, uh, heterogeneity actually in the, in the financial market. So it's, uh, instead of having just commercial bank, they impose also the saving banks. And uh, so they have five agents, household, saving banks, commercial banks, government, and productive firms. And these five agents are connected together through uh, four markets that two of them, deposit market and capital markets, as you can see in this figure, I put them in a very simple version actually, that the deposit market and capital market, they are national ones. So that means the house, the, for example, the core countries household, they can just raise deposit in the national or the core countries saving banks or commercial banks also they can invest in the uh, domestic capital, capital market. But they put the saving banks and the saving banks, they can engage or they can, uh, they can invest in the two union market. That means the union interbank market and also union bond market. So the saving banks in, uh, for example, the saving banks of the core country, they can buy bonds from both governments or they can lend to the commercial banks of the, of the, two, uh, of the two, two countries. But what are my contribution to the model? I take that model uh, and I impose four, uh, four changes in the, in the model. The first thing 
is I impose the heterogeneity in household uh, by, by uh, introducing the inpatient households. So now we have patient households that they are lenders to the, to the saving banks and we have inpatient households. The second thing, the second changes in the model is introducing housing to the balance sheet of the both households. So now patient households, they have access, in the previous model, they have access to, they have, they could, could consume or raise deposit. Now they can invest in, they can buy or sell houses and also uh, inpatient houses, inpatient uh, uh, households. But inpatient households to, to consume or to buy houses, they need uh, mortgages, they need to, to borrow. And this borrowing comes from the commercial banks. That means that the, the third change actually I put in the model is introducing a, a, an imperfect substitution between uh, capital and mortgage in the, in the, uh, um, into uh, the commercial bank's uh, portfolio. And uh, the, the fourth channel, like the, the fourth um, uh, changes is that this credit market is, uh, is uh, constrained. So it's a very typical one, it's very LT, LTV, uh, um, with the, I mean, the, 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 um, uh, the, uh, the inpatient households, they are limited, they are constrained by uh, um, a borrowing constraint that limited their mortgage to a fraction of the value of their housing. So uh, I suppose, as, as you see, there's a very um, minor or very um, uh, uh, modest uh, changes in the, in the modest, modest, uh, modest complexity in the model, in the uh, basic model. So I uh, collaborated actually this- uh, Hamid, with, uh, yeah. excuse me if I interrupt you. Do you mind making this a full screen, like view full screen uh, or something yes. or control L, I believe? I can do Thanks that. so much. That's better now? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So I take that model actually, and I collaborated to the post-crisis euro data uh, over 2009 to uh, 2015, and uh, we have the, the peripheric and core country. That's the peripheric country. That's a very uh, that's a standard one. That's a high debt country. Uh, the, the beginning of 2015 is the Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain, and the core countries are other countries of the of the monetary union. So I use this model to investigate the, the ECB's public service purchase program over two periods. That's a, the, the first period is the asset purchase program uh, during 2015 until end of 2019, and the pandemic emergency purchase program that's uh, happened during 2020 and now nowadays actually. Uh, and actually, I should I should also mention that one that the, for the first for the second one, the pandemic emergency purchase program, I only focused on the first announcement of the ECB, that was the 750 uh, billion euros package uh, and not other amendment that we know after April, we have uh, am amendment and other amendment and also governmental uh, stimulus or other, uh, other uh, changes that other shocks that uh, or the he helps actually in the, in the economy. I only focused on the first announcement and I, I look at that, 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 uh, that um, information actually. So I, I analyzed that one. We know that uh, something happened after, but I stopped actually at that, that point. So uh, for answer, to answer the first question that was the, the contribution of housing and credit market, I compared the response of, of my model to a one person negative shock to the capital quality uh, to, to other models that we had. Uh, here, for example, the, the black lines are my model. The, 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 the uh, red lines are the model of August 2018, and the blue lines are model of Gertrude Karadi, the two versions, two countries version of Gertrude Karadi 2011. And uh, what we see here, actually, the first thing that we see is that introducing housing and credit market, that's my model, is uh, it make more difference and more, uh, more uh, changes, actually, than introducing heterogeneity in the financial markets. That's the work, work of OA 2018, because as you can see, for example, in the, in the, in the um, um, uh, real market, for example, on the output, consumption, investment, or labor, we see that the difference between OA's model and, and uh, Gertrude Coyote is insignificant, but we see that the response to the economy in, in my model, they make a little bit difference. The second thing is that uh, actually I call that a housing accelerator uh, that 
we see that including housing and credit market in the model amplifies the shock on the real on the real economy. We see here, for example, for the output for both countries, the, the, the core country and foreign country, housing, the housing and credit market amplifies the shock and make the, 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 the crisis more severe. And the reason behind that one, I can tell that the housing and credit market actually changes or alter the, the, the four main channels involved in the, in the economy. The first thing is that the housing and uh, credit market, the housing actually uh, uh, changed uh, the, the housing, the household balance sheet channel. We know, as I explained, for example, the, the patient household balance sheet channel uh, in, the, in the previous model, they have just consumption and deposit. Now we have housing. And the behavior of the housing market changed the, the, the deposit market, so changed the liability side of the, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, saving banks, so consequently changed the bond market, the, the behavior, the portfolio uh, decision of the saving banks on the bond market and interbank market. Uh, interbank market. So it also can, it, it, it ch it's changed the, the, the behavior of the uh, commercial banks so change the, the capital market and the mortgage market indirectly. The second thing is about the, the uh, impatient household balance sheet that goes through the loan to value channel because the impatient household, the both consumption and the housing uh, decision of the impatient household depends on the LTV and the value of the house. So, uh, the, so the behavior of the housing can easily change the behavior of the impatient households. And at this one actually led us to the let us uh, leads us to the to the third channel that's the financial sector balance sheet that the housing market also changed the the, the, the commercial banks uh, financial sector the, the commercial banks um, balance sheet because now the behavior of the housing sector can change uh, the, the the portfolio decision of the commercial banks so it, it easily can change the the, the in, in the in, in the another side actually it can change the the, the uh, real uh, market the real economy and also the interbank market and and so on and the last one and the last channel that's a very important in, in this paper and also important in the in the app and uh, the the quantitative easing is the spread channel that get get gets raised to the portfolio balance effect and as, as I'm going to show you that the, the spread channel actually the housing also change the spread channel and the, the uh, effectiveness of the, uh, the, the, um, the actions actually that happen by the central bank and others. So the spread channel also change because the commercial banks, the portfolio of commercial banks changes and the, the housing market can change uh, the spread in the commercial banks and also in the interbank, interbank market so that that can change everything in the, in the model. So, one now, question. So in yes. the previous slide, didn't also the government risk, um, if you go back one slide, please. Yes. I saw that government default risk is much more volatile. Is this connected to the generally higher volatility that you seem to get from, from, from your mechanism? Uh, actually, How do we, what's the intuition there? Uh, the intuition here actually is for the government, uh, because government uh, default is related to the debt to, the debt to GDP. And uh, here, actually, what, what we see here, uh, the behavior of, so I didn't show here because I, I, told, I, I, I told that uh, I didn't mention lots of details here. Uh, I think it's because of the behavior of the, of the commercial, of the uh, saving banks through the, uh, the interbank market. For example, at the beginning here, in the interbank market, we see that we have, a, we have increase, but uh, we have increase in the interbank, interbank market. So that, that means there's more, uh, resources in the interbank market and less in the in the um, in the in the um, uh, how to say in the uh, debt. To, I mean the, in, that means the commercial the, the saving banks uh, when there is a shock in this in this case they prefer to buy more bonds. So when they buy more bonds, that it, it increases debt to GDP actually. And when the debt to GDP increases, the, the government default risk also increases because in, in my model, the government default risk, is, is default risk is related directly to debt to GDP. So uh, actually housing changes because um, this is more resources maybe goes to the interbank. As you can see, for example, in my model, uh, co uh, comparing to the uh, previous model, the interbank market is, uh, is declined actually more uh, drastically than uh, 
than the previous model. So because of that, you can see uh, we have more uh, bond uh, purchased by the government, by the saving banks. So the government uh, debt to GDP actually increases. So the government default increases uh, also in, the, in this model actually. So it is, it is I think it, it could be a one, one reason behind, behind of that one. Okay, thank you. So uh, no, now we uh, actually got that. Uh, we got the answer actually to the first question that I will show. Actually, I show that the housing and credit market matters in the in the economy and also in the time of crisis. Now I focus on the second part of the of the paper. It was about the interaction between the housing and unconventional monetary policy. To do so, I because in the model we have the state, the, 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 the uh, central bank. But uh, in the previous actually analysis, the, the, the role of the central bank was to keep the monetary union, to keep the, the control, the, no, uh, the uh, uh, nominal interest rate through the zero lower bond. But now we introduce another responsibility for the union central bank, and that one is engaging in the union bond market so that now the central bank can buy bonds uh, from the government. Uh, it's a very standard actually in the in the literature that they can buy bonds from the from, from the government, but I have some assumption here. The first assumption is that the purchase is symmetric between core and periphery country. So I assume that the, the purchase is as, 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 is, is the, they, the purchases are symmetric. The second thing is that I run a series of the perfect foresight simulation based on the ECB's decisions from 2015 until end of 2019. That these decisions actually are here. So whenever we have a new announcement, so we have a new information, agents, they have new information by the size of the, the package or the duration of, this, of the package, I run a new uh, perfect foresight simulation based on the final point of the last uh, simulation and uh, the new shocks and the new information that we have uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the model. So it's a, uh, it's a series actually of the, of the simulation that I run uh, one after uh, another one when we have a new information with the new, uh, with, with the new announcement of the ECB, for example, with the, with the new size or new purchase on, and other things. So here actually uh, we have the, um, the response of the economy uh, to the, the APP, the pure APP, the black lines here, are the response of the economy to the, the pure APP. That means uh, without any shock, I assume there's no shock in the economy, just the APP. And the red lines actually, they are the answer that the response of the economy to the same shock, to the, to the same APP. But uh, during the crisis, similar to 2008 crisis, um, that means for, I, that I have the, a negative uh, shock to the capital quality so that it makes a 5% uh, GDP contraction for, uh, for, the, uh, for the periphery country and a 4% GDP contraction for the, um, uh, for the core country. So here I just uh, showed the, the, the net uh, response and the net, net answer actually. So here, I didn't show the, the, the crisis because we already showed that one in the, in the previous um, uh, slide. Here is just the net answer. So what we see here, actually, we see the first thing we see here is that the performance of the APP during the crisis is much better than the performance of the APP uh, alone. We see here, for example, at the real economy for the output and for the, uh, for the output consumption uh, investment and all of that. And the reason actually is, uh, I think the, the reason is through the portfolio rebalancing channel because we know that for the portfolio rebalancing channel is the main channel of the of the AP of the quantitative easing. The, 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 it increased the I mean the when the central bank start to buy bonds, it increased the prices. And they reduce the yield. They reduce yield. So the, so actually we have a shift. Uh, we have the uh, rebalancing. In the, we have a rebalance actually in the in the portfolio of the saving bank, so we have more uh, um, uh, through the, instead of buying bonds, they shift the uh, um, investment to the other assets. So when there's a crisis, actually, we see the debt to GDP is higher. 
So when the, the, the GDP is higher, that means that the, actually the, the portfolio rebalancing channel is more sensible to the, uh, to the, uh, to the APP and to the quantitative easing. So that, um, that the quantitative easing is more effective because debt to GDP is higher. And so any change of that one to make and, and a small change in the, in the uh, interest rate can make a big changes in the, uh, in, in the, in the economy. The second thing that we can see here is that actually the behavior of the house, the house prices here is the first thing we see is with any announcement, we have an increase in the house price because again, because of the portfolio rebalancing channel, we have they have more resources to the interbank market and commercial banks, they have more uh, resources available for the capital and mortgage. So there is more um, the supply of mortgage lower interest rate so there are more uh, impatient house households that they they, they can afford uh, uh, housing and housing but the interesting thing here actually we see for the house prices after each announcement we see an increase in the in the house price but that couldn't last long and that we see right after that increase we see a decrease in the in the house price uh, and the reason behind that one, actually, that uh, I tried actually to, to interpret that one is, I, I think actually that the reason is uh, the interaction between the household, the household balance sheets, the impatient household and the patient households. Because in this model, uh, the supply of housing is normalized to one because I want to focus more uh, on the demand side. Uh, so when the impatient household increases the, the, the amount of housing, that means there is a decrease in the, uh, in the patient households, uh, household uh, housing. So when there's more uh, mortgage available, so there is more uh, impatient household uh, housing demand. And this one increases the housing price. But because of the dynamic of the model, this, this couldn't uh, continue because there is a uh, in decreasing. There is a decline in the in the patient housing demand, and this impacts and this reduces the the uh, the housing price in the economy. So we can see this uh, go and up in the in the housing price, like the, the housing prices after each announcement and after that decreases uh, after next announcement if we have another one. And that is exactly related to the size of the you know, size of the APP. If it is higher, the higher that we, have, we see the the, uh, the biggest jump, and if it is lower, we see the lowest the lower uh, jump in the house price. And after that, we see the decreases. Now, uh, I want to go to the uh, I want to look at the behavior of the of the economy in my model and for the PEEP and the Great Lockdown. The structure of the of the quantitative easing is exactly the same. Is exactly the same assumption. The same, the same thing is symmetric. It is exactly the same thing, but the size of the the envelope is is, is changed because in the P in the PP you have 7.3 percent of the of the Euro GDP, and uh, the thing actually here is about the Great Lockdown, about the lockdown, the first lockdown that we had in in, in Europe. And I didn't um, uh, simulate or model this Great Lockdown as a simple shock to the normal dynamic of the model, for example, to the disability of labor. I tried to model that one as a, as a partial shutdown in a labor market through a government order. So we have actually a, a labor supply, but there is no uh, labor demand because government stopped the, the market. So it, I tried to show that one through a, a, a crisis literature, uh, mostly the Gertzer Kyoto, Kyoto 2015, so uh, actually after 2019, the, the, the end, uh, end of 2019, we jumped to the new, uh, the new equilibrium. And at this equilibrium, we have a recession of uh, minus 4.3% in the core country and minus 3.4% in the, in the periphery country based on the uh, Euro statistic uh, on that one. And we assume that there is no shock after that, the, the first shock. There is no uh, lockdown after the first lockdown. So we have we have a new equilibrium and we have a perfect for, uh, for, uh, foresight model to so to see that how economy responds, how economy actually go from this point to uh, to the next point that is the initial um, um, uh, initial study state at the end of 2019. And when we 
uh, model actually the, uh, the, uh, the economy and we, we simulated the economy, we see the results here, the, red, the, the black lines are the response of the economy to the great lockdown uh, and the red lines are the response of the economy with the uh, quantitative easing. As you can see here, the labor market are the same, are the first to, to recover actually, because there is no, um, there's no obstruction for them uh, to, to stop them to, for, from the recovery. They recover, they have some uh, rigidities in the, in the capital market or in the, in the economy, but we see that it's it come back to the, to the normal uh, before and also investment, before other variables, but we see that doesn't have, this doesn't happen for the output actually. So it takes time for the output. The reason could be the consumption and also could be the housing market because we see the housing market because of the rigidities and the dynamic of the model, they, uh, the housing market couldn't come back to the normal as soon as, for example, the labor market and investment. Uh, investment. The second thing is important here actually in this figure uh, shows is the performance of the PEEP uh, P actually. I know that we have other elements and we have other uh, uh, stimulus in the, in the economy, but here we see that the PEEP is most effective on the financial bond and credit market, but couldn't really stimulate the consumption. Uh, and, and we know the consumption is the highest uh, share of the output with uh, about 65%. So it, it couldn't uh, stimulate consumption. It couldn't really accelerate the recovery in the output and, and GDP. So the first implication of, of this, this results is that uh, more actions are, are, are needed. Simply more actions are needed. We probably we need timely targeted fiscal policies in order to uh, stimulate the, the demand side and just uh, uh, the only uh, PEEP on only quantitative easing for these kinds of recession uh, definitely is not enough. To make a little bit more sense and to make it a little bit more clear, here also I showed the, the pure impact of the, of the PEEP without any shock, that is the, the black line, and also uh, the, the net answer, the net response of the economy to the, to the quantitative easing in the presence of the crisis that the, that the lockdown. Uh, we, have, we see exactly the same thing here, for example, about the housing market after the announcement, we see the, an increase in the housing price. And again, because of the interaction between the inpatient household and patient uh, housing, a decrease, uh, a steady decrease in the, in, the, in the housing price. But the interesting thing here that I add something to the, to the presentation is that the, to, the, to the results is the behavior of the intermont market actually. Because here I assume that because of based on the first announcement of the ECB, I assume that the PEEP, the quantitative easing finished at the end of 2020. And we see here in the intermont market, as soon as we finish, the, the, the quantitative easing, we have a move from the, the um, uh, because before that we have more resources in the income market, but when it's a stop, again, the, the saving banks start to, to retake more bonds because we know the situation of the economy is not good, it, it, it still is not good. So there is more intention, there is more, uh, uh, the, the, I mean, there's more intention for, for the saving banks to retake the, the, the bonds and that one increases the, the debt to GDP. So we see a, a huge drop in the, in the interbank market because the saving, the saving banks, they try to the rebalance their the, the portfolio through the interbank market to the bond market. And we see at the left that in, this increases debt to GDP uh, hugely in the, in the model. So this shows actually the impact uh, of prematurely ended programs. So actually I, uh, propose in this paper that uh, the, the, the impacts of prematurely ended program can be worse than the crisis itself. Uh, so I propose that, I mean, this is also that, that this is what happened, that the PP, that, that PEEP or quantitative easing should be extended until the COVID-19 uh, crisis phase is over if it is not uh, over, uh, it is not, um, uh, it is finished before this is over that could have negative impacts on the financial sector, and the, especially on the stability of the financial sector and can make a little bit, um, there's some problems actually in the, uh, in, the, in the economy and the financial sector. So uh, I don't know, I have time or... Uh, we have about three minutes. So if I encourage participants, if you have questions, you can submit them through the Q&A. 
Um, so yes, because so, so, I, I prefer to stop here actually because I just I have a very full analysis also for the APP and also for the crisis for the PEEP and uh, the lockdown that I have uh, some some results uh, uh, on that one. But I, I prefer to stop here as you as you told. And if there is any question or any suggestion, that would be great. Yes. No. Thank you very much. It's a great presentation. Um, so if there are any questions. Um, it is possible to submit them through Q&A, but not chat. So this, this, uh, this will be your moment. Um, if not, I, I have a brief question. So you basically, I guess you don't have an optimal path to exit from this purchases program, right? You would, mm -hmm. but you would suggest it should be something more gradual or extended. Yes, actually, to what some I, point. exactly what I, what I propose because here in the, in the first model, I, I didn't mention here in the, in the presentation because it gets a little bit long. Here we can see at the beginning of the uh, of the APP here in 2015 2016 the impact of the of the APP is is very insignificant it's not a lot but because of the signaling uh, channels because of the size of the of the uh, APP uh, after the first announcement in after the first announcement in 2015 we have an amount, uh, amendment in 2016 that increases the, the size of the APP and also the long, the, the duration of the APP. And we see the impact of that one is huge uh, comparing to the first one because of the initial condition and also because of the signaling channel. Because now the agents, now that everything, the, the, the interest rate is low, low so they change their the behavior. So I think it is important to keep exactly the same structure for the PIP. Here, what I showed, it is only for, uh, the 750 billion euros package that, uh, that uh, the agent thinks it's going to be end at the end of 2020. But uh, what I propose is exactly what you said. It should be continued and even depending on the phase, depending on what we see, maybe the, 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 the package should be uh, extended and also the, the size of the package should be increased. Uh, but if it is, uh, what I showed here actually in the interbank market, you see, if it is stopped, when the, the phase is not still over, we see a huge shift in the interbank inter market because uh, the bond market maybe is more uh, attractive at that point. So the, the saving banks try to, 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 to shift their, their, their portfolio to the bond market. So the interbank market could be impacted hugely. So okay, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I think we have to keep time here. Oh, great. We started thank two you minutes so much. late. So thank you very much. And uh, I believe Eric, you you be next. So um, I, I'll let you uh, share your screen, and uh, the floor okay. uh, is yours. Okay, very good. Um, thanks a lot to Raphael and uh, for organizing this, and thanks also to folks for uh, showing up on a Sunday morning uh, from your homes or wherever it is that you're participating from. Uh, this is joint work with Cynthia Wu, my colleague at Notre Dame, and it, it is frankly a bit of a grand title for what I kind of think of as sort of a quick and dirty way to try to think about the efficacy or potential desirability of some of the different things that the Fed announced that it would do and has done to some extent over the last seven months that it announced back in March. I should also point out that this is a little bit dated in a sense that we wrote this paper kind of in the throes of things and haven't had a whole bunch of opportunities to work on it since then. Um, Hold on one second. Why won't it let me? There we go. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, it's kind of a grand title, Wall Street versus Main Street QE, trying to be catchy. What do we mean um, with that distinction? So what we mean by Wall Street QE are really asset purchases involving financial firms, the kind of stuff that the Fed did in the wake of the last crisis and the several years thereafter, buying uh, long-term assets from financial institutions. One could also think about uh, lending involving non-financial, or pardon me, lending, lending uh, to financial firms, although that's not QE proper. What we mean by Main Street QE to differentiate it from Wall Street QE is, is asset purchases or direct lending to non-financial firms. And if you go back to the end of March, the March 23rd announcement um, that the Fed was going to begin interacting with non-financial firms, this was a big departure from standard central bank practice. And so a couple of different facilities that it established, the primary market corporate credit facility, the secondary market corporate credit facility, and the Main Street Lending Program, 
I should mention that the Main Street Lending Program, for example, is ending. It was just renewed for another week as of last week. And I should also point out that they actually haven't done a whole lot of this lending or asset purchases from non-financial firms. But nevertheless, this represented, it represented a significant uh, break from central bank practice, which was prior to the Great Recession was to only interact with banks. And then this was extended to interact with financial firms and then in March of 2020, the Fed extended its reach to dealing with non-financial firms. I should also mention what we do not do in this paper, which is there's a whole host of issues related to central bank independence uh, that we're not going to address. Um, you know, there's issues related to whether these kind of actions could be better on fiscal authority, perfectly legitimate point to make. We're not going to address that question. What we're really trying to address is the question of whether it makes sense to do what we're referring to as Main Street QE in addition to sort of the more traditional QE that the Fed enacted in the wake of the Great Recession. All right, so um, that's sort of our contribution is to try to assess the efficacy of the Fed directly lending to non-financial firms and to try to understand the situations in which that might make sense. And kind of the key friction that we're going to emphasize here relative to some of our other work that we've done that we think is particularly relevant for this environment is a cash flow constraint. And so loosely, this is based on both the empirical and theoretical work of Thomas Drexel at the University of Maryland in his job market paper. And we think that this is arguably a key feature of COVID-19 with lockdowns and other policies that led to a significant drying up of cash flows for non-financial firms in a way that was very different from the kind of recession that we had in 2008, 2009, where this was much more focused on balance sheets of intermediaries. And so just to highlight what we're going to argue here is that what we're calling Main Street versus Wall Street QE, in a world without this cash flow constraint, these things are perfectly isomorphic. As I'll describe, we have a setup that going back to the previous presentation is kind of based on a Gertler Karate kind of framework. And in essence, when the central bank is engaging in asset purchases in that framework, it is intermediating uh, in place of financial intermediaries. And if we're in a world without this cash flow constraint, these two things are completely isomorphic. Whether the Fed buys debt issued by non-financial firms through intermediaries or buys it directly from the non-financial firms is irrelevant. If we're in a world of what we call COVID-19, which we're going to think about as a situation in which this cash flow constraint is binding on non-financial firms, we're going to argue that this uh, isomorphism does no longer hold. In particular, what we call Main Street QE could be highly effective, whereas Wall Street QE becomes completely ineffective. And so the way to think about this is that what we're going to argue is that the particular features of the recession that we've been experiencing for the last eight or so months might make something like what we're calling Main Street QE make a lot of sense. If so, I may interrupt uh, what you, Eric, I'm there was a, Eric, if I may interrupt you, there was a question from Steve that, that might, you might have, you know, might have a chance to answer in the Q&A. And I think it's directly touching okay. on this issue, how you, how you define purchases and, and, and maybe what the Fed up in your model will be. So the Fed does not buy assets from finance. So yes, the Fed buys assets from markets. That is correct. Um, fully guaranteed government securities. Yeah, so of course, it, so it, what we're calling Wall Street QE, they are buying from markets. They're not buying directly from financial firms, but markets are intermediating or markets are in a sense intermediating between intermediaries and, uh, and the Fed. Um, and so what we're going to think about here is uh, we're going to, the, as I will describe in a second, the Fed, uh, what we're going to call Main Street QE, non-financial firms are going to be issuing debt to finance investment. And this is going to be a situation in which the Fed can buy this directly, which we could think about in the simple framework that we have as being isomorphic to the Fed directly lending uh, to those firms. So I think this will be clear as I get through into the presentation. Um, okay, so let me walk through the model briefly. Um, hold on a second. Okay, so in the background, I'm going to leave out a bunch of the details here. This is going to be similar to a paper that Cynthia and I have um, that is based on Gertler Karate or the key friction in Gertler Karate with an additional friction 
there's a number of different actors here, most of whom I'm not going to spend a bunch of time talking about. There's going to be production firms, what we call wholesale firms, financial intermediaries, a fiscal authority, and a central bank. And so let me walk. So the first point here is that there's going to be long-term debt in this model. Um, it just said my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully this works. Um, the long-term debt in the model are going to take the form of perpetual bonds going back to Woodford. So these are perpetuities with decaying coupon payments where you can calibrate the decay parameter to match a given duration. And this is sort of simply a trick to minimize the state space where you've got long-term debt issued and you don't have to keep track of particular issuances, rather just the stock of total issuances. There's going to be a production firm we're going to call it a representative wholesale firm that's going to produce output using a standard Cobb Douglas production technology. It owns its own capital and it accumulates this by purchasing uh, newly produced investment goods I hat from an investment goods producer. There's going to be some adjustment cost in terms of the investment goods producer it doesn't show up here. Um, and the wholesale firm is going to be subject to what we're going to call an investment constraint. This is used in an AEJ macro paper by Carlstrom, Fierst, and Pausti in 2017. And the constraint here is kind of similar to a cash and advance constraint. We, in essence, are just going to require that firms finance some fraction of their investment by issuing these long-term bonds into markets. And so QT is going to be the price of these bonds. The F is the stock of bonds, this F minus kappa, F minus one. This is the flow of bonds that are issued. Psi is a parameter that we can calibrate to the data. This is simply a way to make firms have to issue debt. And so we're going to assume that this constraint is always binding, both when we're considering kind of a great recession kind of setup as well as a COVID-19 setup. In addition, we're going to consider a cash flow constraint. And again, this is based on the work of Thomas Drexel where we assume that the amount of debt that non-financial firms can issue is restricted to a fraction of their operating cash flows. So this is the revenue minus their labor expenses. And there's a VAR fee parameter there that determines what fraction of their cash flows they can, they can uh, borrow up against or issue debt up against. And so this is a bit of an ad hoc constraint. Thomas's paper to discusses some more micro foundations for this, but we're going to take this as given and as something that is potentially binding during what we're going to call the COVID-19 experiment. So the wholesale firm is going to have some first order conditions that are relatively standard. I just want to mention here on this slide that there are a couple of Lagrange multipliers referring to these two constraints. Lambda two is a multiplier on this investment constraint that firms have to issue long-term bonds to finance some fraction of their investment. And Lambda three is this multiplier on the cash flow constraint. These are going to enter very similar, similarly or enter almost I, I, in an isomorphic way in terms of the first order condition for bonds. The cash flow constraint is gonna enter differently in the uh, first order condition for physical capital. It's going to look, if you will, like a tax on the returns on capital. Is a question, Eric, on if the cash flow constraint is the same as the debt to income ratio in the Q&A? Is that the same as the debt to income ratio? No, it's not. So debt is a stock, income is a flow. I guess you could, uh, this is newly debt issued debt on the left-hand side, and this is income on the right-hand side. So it's not a debt to income ratio. It's uh, issuance of new debt relative to income is the way to think about that. All right. Okay, so um, intermediaries. And so the structure of the model here is that there are uh, production firms, we call wholesale firms that have to float long-term bonds to finance some fraction of their investment. And intermediaries stand between savers and borrowers. So there's households on the right-hand side of uh, the structure here where households save through short-term debt or deposits, which is how intermediaries fund themselves. There's also a government, uh, this somewhat goes back to Steve's question about there's government debt here in the background that takes the same form as the debt that is issued by production firms. The government is issuing long-term debt to finance its operations. This is uh, being issued and ultimately held by intermediaries. And so markets are segmented here in the sense that households cannot directly hold the debt of firms or of the government. They can only indirectly hold that debt through deposits or claims on the intermediaries. Intermediaries hold the long-term debt issued by firms and the government. The central bank can also purchase assets from intermediaries. 
and finances its operations through reserves, which are a short-term asset that the intermediaries hold on their balance sheets. So there's four types of debt instruments in this model. There's two short-term instruments, deposits and reserves, and there's two long-term instruments, uh, privately issued debt and government bonds. We could denote the returns on these via R's, capital R's, which are nominal returns, okay? So intermediaries have a balance sheet. Uh, there are a continuum of intermediaries. Some are born and some are dying every period. I'm going to omit uh, uh, the intermediary subscripts and in writing this down. They have a balance sheet, which says that they finance themselves on the right-hand side of the balance sheet with some equity that's denoted by N and some deposits that's denoted by D, short-term debt. And on the asset side of the balance sheet, they can hold privately issued debt, the market value of which is Q times F. They can hold long-term debt issued by the government. Again, this long-term debt issued by the government also takes this form of a decaying perpetuity, the market value of which is QB times B, and then they can hold reserves as well on the asset side of the balance sheet. Net worth over time is going to evolve according to a law of motion that depends on excess returns relative to the interest rate on uh, deposits. Uh, the capital pi here is a gross inflation term. This is to write this in nominal terms where the lowercase variables here are all real terms. Um, there's a value function for uh, the intermediaries which takes the following form. It's based on Gertler and Karate and there is some exit probability sigma um, that exists or one minus sigma is the exit probability. Sigma is the probability of continuing. The idea here is that you need intermediaries to die or to effectively be less impatient than households so that they do not over accumulate net worth to make uh, the constraints that we're going to talk about non-binding. So if the financial intermediary were unconstrained, so if I just took this setup right here subject to no further constraints and think about how many of each kind of asset it wants to hold, the first order conditions would equate uh, returns on all assets, right? So we would have no excess returns long-term government bonds, long-term private sector bonds and reserves would all offer the same return as deposits, the cost of funding for intermediaries. And I should mention here, capital lambda is the stochastic discount factor that intermediaries use, which is based on the household. What we do is we introduce an endogenous leverage constraint. Again, this is based on Gertler and Karate. Uh, each period, we assume that intermediaries can abscond, can exit, with a stochastic fraction theta of their assets, um, non-reserve assets, they can abscond with a fraction theta of their privately issued bonds and a fraction theta times delta where delta is between zero and one of their government bonds. And so that delta parameter, what that does is it's going to allow a spread between privately issued returns on privately issued bonds and returns on government bonds. You can show uh, through some analysis that this effectively works out to an endogenous leverage constraint where the leverage of intermediaries is constrained. And so with this setup, what this is going to do is it's going to introduce excess returns because if you go back to this constraint reserves don't enter this, there's going to be no excess returns on reserves, which means that the interest rate on reserves is gonna be the same as the deposit rate. Um, but there are, in general, going to be excess returns on both the government bond and the privately issued bond. Lambda T here is a multiplier on the constraint. Uh, these returns are going to differ by this fraction uh, delta. And so what this is going to tell us is that there's going to be an excess return of privately issued bonds over government bonds. This capital omega is effectively just an additional discount term that shows up in the stochastic discount factor to account for the fact that intermediaries are going to stochastically exit with some probability. So central bank has a balance sheet where it can hold privately issued debt and it can hold government issued debt and it finances this with reserves. Hello? Well, I think there was just some noise, so you should be okay. Okay, just, so, okay. okay. Um, I can't see anybody's pictures, so. Okay, so the central bank's balance sheet is kind of standard and we assume that the central bank uh, is going to set the interest rate on reserves according to a standard Taylor kind of rule. And so we're gonna to refer to that as the policy rate, okay? 
And so how do we think about uh, central bank bond holding, right? So we're going to think about the long-term bonds that the central bank holds. Here we write these as privately issued bonds. You could write these as publicly issued bonds. It's not going to matter except up to scale. We're going to split this into two different components. And for ease of exposition, we're going to think about these as following exogenous AR1 processes. And so we're going to split these into two components, what we call QE. This is purchases of assets that are not directly issued by non-financial firms and QEM, which are assets that are going to be purchased directly from uh, non-financial firms, both of which are gonna follow simple AR1 processes. And so how do we think about uh, what we call Wall Street versus Main Street QE? So if you go back, and again, I realize I've done this rather quickly. If you go back uh, to the um, to the wholesale firms problem and think about this in conjunction with the intermediary problem, the net bond issuance of 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 wholesale firms that has to be absorbed by intermediaries cannot exceed some multiple of current cash flows. So this goes back to the cash flow constraint. Okay, and so the right hand side is the multiple of cash flows. The left-hand side here is denoting the value of bonds issued by non-financial firms that are absorbed by financial intermediaries. And so the QEM terms and that, that QEM minus kappa pi inverse QE minus one M, that's the net flow that is absorbed directly by the central bank. That enters with a negative sign because if the central bank is, is uh, buying this debt directly from these firms, there's less of it that has to be absorbed by intermediaries. And so the way to think about this is that what we're calling uh, Main Street QE is what this does is it in a very direct way loosens the cash flow constraint, which in turn is going to allow firms to issue more debt. And we think to the extent to which this kind of constraint is binding uh, is going to be especially relevant. Whereas the way to think about what we're calling Wall Street QE, this is in essence exactly the way that it works in Gertler Karate. Uh, we have this endogenous leverage constraint, which is going to result in interest rate spreads. The yield on long-term privately issued debt is going to exceed the yield on government bonds, which in turn exceeds the yield on deposits. And Wall Street QE works by loosening this endogenous leverage constraint. In essence, what's going on is that when the central bank purchases assets from intermediaries, it reduces the bonds that are on intermediary balance sheets, which eases the leverage constraints that intermediaries face, which in turn allows them to purchase more bonds from the private sector and therefore stimulates investment. And so in a sense, the way that Wall Street QE works is that uh, uh, the central bank is effectively substituting for private intermediation, which in can a sense it's also one? doing when you, yes, well, I can go back one okay. slide. I saw Taylor was somewhere. I was wondering, so what is exactly, what is the central bank targeting? And is there any difference there in terms of- so The central bank is just, set, we're, just set, we're just setting the short-term interest rate on reserves. Okay, so there's, there's which no is in change. Turn going to be equal to the, which is in turn equal to the deposit rate. And so if you think about those other spreads as be, you know, if you think about conventional monetary policy, so to speak, to the extent to which the spreads are fixed, changing the interest rate on reserves changes the interest rate on deposits, which is going to move those other interest rates in tandem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I also see there's another question in the QA. So if we could. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. Let me open it up. That. that just popped up. So I think it's a timely interruption. Why do bonds need to be long-term? Uh, they actually don't need to be long-term. This is just sort of a way to think about conventional versus unconventional policy, right? So we could set this kappa, um, yeah, there's nothing special about the bonds being long-term. This is just sort of a way to discipline the model and be able to think about things like yield curves and interest rate spreads across the maturity structure. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. Okay, um, where was I? Okay. So if you don't have this cash flow constraint binding, one can show that there's an equivalence between these two types of purchases, whether you purchase assets uh, directly from uh, non-financial firms or whether you purchase them from intermediaries, uh, it's completely equivalent. In fact, as I just said a minute ago, it's like the central bank substituting for private intermediation. And I guess maybe going back to an earlier question here, yes, it's true that all, all these purchases happen through markets. What's relevant 
in a sense is how much uh, how many how many bonds end up on the balance sheets of intermediaries versus on the balance sheet of the central bank and that sort of ties into this constraint that our intermediaries are subject to. However, when the so called cash flow constraint binds it is relatively straightforward to show that Wall Street QE becomes completely ineffective and the simple way to see this is to combine the investment constraint with the cash flow constraint and in a sense what this shows is that the amount of investment that firms can do, the new physical capital that it can purchase is simply restricted by its current cash flows. And so the bond price of the long-term debt that they're issuing doesn't enter into that constraint. Whereas in the sort of Main Street or Wall Street QE, excuse me, this works by the central bank purchases uh, bonds from intermediaries. This allows intermediaries to purchase more bonds. This increases bond prices and therefore eases this investment constraint that is facing non-financial firms and allows for more investment. When the cash flow constraint is also binding, this is completely irrelevant. This is There's another question. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, Raphael perfect. gave me the Raphael seems to have given me the ability to speak. Um, I I have a question about so in the current instance, the Fed not only created these bizarre facilities to lend um, into the to, to purchase uh, corporate bonds, but they also ease the leverage ratio constraint of the banks. Is that going to be the same thing here? So they 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 reduced they effective they did something complicated, but it effectively reduced the leverage ratio constraint. So if I if I change regulations, am I going to do the same thing? Yes. yes, that would be exactly the same here. So if you had intermediaries subject to a statutory leverage constraint. That would work similar. In effect, what's going on in the way that the model works is that if you do, again, what we call Wall Street QE, you're buying bonds, taking them off the balance sheets of intermediaries, which endogenously eases their leverage constraint, which allows them to buy more. In effect, you're substituting for private intermediation. If you thought about them as being or statutory leverage constraint, this would have a... Okay. And seeing assets that end up not on the balance sheet of intermediaries becomes completely ineffective, but purchasing assets directly from non-financial firms becomes highly effective in the sense here that firms are constrained by how much debt they can issue as a function of their cash flows or the amount, pardon me, I should say, the amount of new debt that will be absorbed by intermediaries is constrained as a fraction or as a multiple of the cash flows of intermediaries. Purchasing this directly, directly eases that constraint. And so um, a couple of sort of simple uh, impulse response exercises uh, to sort of show how this works. If you think about Wall Street QE, there's no cash flow constraint binding. The central bank goes in and it buys some long-term government bonds. This is going to stimulate the economy through an easing of the leverage constraint on intermediaries, allows them to buy more bonds. This pushes bond prices up. Bond prices up means yields are down. This allows firms to do more investment. But if you do what we call Wall Street QE in a world where the cash flow constraint is binding, this becomes approximately neutral for the real economy because investment is simply constrained by current cash flows. In contrast, and I'm trying to hustle up here so that we can get stay on time. Um, if you do what we call Main Street QE, this is very, very stimulative in a world in which the cash flow constraint binds, albeit it's much less, it's much less persistent. And so I should mention here there's kind of a magnifying mechanism that you relax the cash flow constraint by doing what we're calling this Main Street QE. This in turn allows firms to accumulate more capital, but higher future capital stocks in turn further loosen the cash flow constraint. Uh, through endogenous uh, price adjustments in this world of the cash flow constraint. And kind of the simple way to think about that is, is to simply stock versus flow. What we're calling Main Street QE is working through a flow channel. There's a flow constraint on firms that the amount of investment they can do is restricted by their flow uh, revenues. And if you purchase these assets, you mechanically allow them to do more flow. Whereas what we're calling uh, Wall Street QE works more through a stock channel. Basically, you're altering the asset composition on the balance sheets of intermediaries, which is allowing them uh, to purchase more assets and easing their endogenous leverage constraint. That's working through a stock channel as opposed to a flow. And so we, we get more persistence there. And so 
just a quick summary, as I mentioned earlier, this is kind of a quick and dirty way to think about this. I think that the, the main message that we wanna push home here is that when thinking about sort of non-standard uh, asset purchases or non-standard lending facilities more generally, kind of the key thing here is to think about what frictions are most binding. And so in sort of the great recession experiment, the friction that's important there is that intermediaries were constrained. And so purchasing assets, changing the asset composition on intermediary balance sheets eased that constraint and allowed for credit to flow to non-financial firms. In the current environment, it's more so that there's a separate constraint that is binding where firms have cash flows that have dried up, which prevents them from being able to issue debt, even if intermediaries had the balance sheet capacity to buy it. And so the idea here is that you want to purchase assets and or lend freely where you're allocating funds to where constraints are most binding. And again, what are we not doing? We're not thinking about political economy issues. We're not thinking about independence issues. And this is uh, glossing over a bunch of details here. But as I said, it's kind of a quick and dirty way to try to think about um, a motivation or try to think about the efficacy of some of the stuff that the Fed announced that it was going to do and why that might be different than sort of its more traditional QE and lending um, programs that it had previously instituted. So thank you. T terrific. Just on time, Eric. There's one, one minute for questions, which actually which we have one in the Q&A session. Um, can you please speak on the different effects on inflation between Wall Street QE and Main Street QE? Um, yeah, they're both going to be inflationary. Um, and it's just going to, and again, hold on a second. Both of what these do is they're, they're stimulating aggregate demand, right? You're stimulating investment demand from non-financial firms. And so this is pushing up aggregate demand. <clears throat> and so... Both are stimulating inflation, um, and this is sort of just going to be proportional to the amount by which it stimulates output. And so these differences here, there's some differences in terms of persistence uh, because of, again, this stock versus flow distinction, but there's not a fundamental difference in terms of what happens to the aggregate price level. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's an excellent presentation for the sake of keeping somewhat close to time. I think we'll move on to the next paper. If uh, Ernesto, I believe you're presenting. If you could uh, share your screen, please. And uh, the floor is yours if you unmute yourself. Okay, thank you very much uh, to the SEVRA and the AEA for hosting the session, Rafael and other organizers for putting the program together and getting our paper in the program, and all of you for being uh, uh, with us today, wherever you are uh, around the world. Uh, this is this paper is called Pricing and the Distress. This is John Ward with Boragan Aruba, Andres Fernandez, a new co-author that is not in the program, uh, Daniel Guzman, uh, myself, Ernesto Pastén, and Felipe Sapi. My co-authors are in the audience, so I believe that they will try to answer questions that may pop up uh, during the presentation. In any case, I've streamlined the uh, presentation. Try, I'll do my best to leave some time at the end, either for uh, broader discussion or for time for the uh, uh, for the next speaker. Okay. So this paper falls into a, a, a category of papers talking about the trying to shed light on the natural nominal price rigidity by looking at some specific episodes. In this particular paper, we are going to look at one episode, which is the occurrence of riots in Chile. And we are going to think of it as a quasi-natural experiment to think about a little bit about this big question. Uh, we believe that this is a quasi-natural experiment for an, an attractive quasi-natural experiment for a variety of reasons. First, it's an unexpected event with quite uh, 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 quite high geographical variation, which may be attracted to study this type of questions. Second, we have a rich data set of supermarkets, both at the prices that supermarkets set and the prices that supermarkets buy, what we call the replacement cost, to study the pricing behavior of supermarkets taking care of these two different uh, margins. And uh, something that I'm not going to show you today is what, uh, think about what type of models are going to fit this empirical result. In addition to this, we think that riot itself is a pretty uh, interesting phenomenon to look at for a bunch of reasons. 
first, Chile is not the only country in the world that has been recently affected by riots, and given the current political situations, may not be the last one. And second, uh, uh, we want to think about uh, what, how macro works different in episode of severe, maybe political distress or other type of, of real distress that is not related to, the, related to, to uh, economic uh, phenomenon, but they have some economic consequences. So these are the main results. Uh, I'm going to skip the literature review as always for this coming short presentations, but feel free to jump in anytime you want. Um, despite the geographical variation in intensity of riots, we find that the effects are pretty widespread. So even if the riots may have been affecting different, different type of retailers and, uh, uh, and supermarkets, we observe that all of them behave more or less in the same way. The second key result is that this is going to be a strong effect on supermarket pricing behavior, but it's gonna be zero effect on, uh, or no significant effect on supermarket suppliers behavior. Next, we're gonna find for the supermarkets more stickiness on both positive and negative price changes. There's gonna be a higher uh, average size of non-zero price changes for both positive and negative. And we're also going to observe the smaller fraction of the small price changes, especially for the negative ones. So let me start doing a very brief accounting of the unfolding events that we call riots. On October 6, 2019, Santiago Subway Fair gets raised by approximately 30 uh, cents. Students, um, High, high school and, university and college students make a call to demonstrate uh, uh, against this, uh, uh, this race with quite limited success for a couple of weeks. Actually, some government office, officials publicly ridiculize the students' call by saying, hey, this guy, this, this didn't work out, let's go back to normal. And in that process on October 18th, there was a massive disruption of Santiago subway organized by the students. And there was a very, very strong police response that basically angry everyone. Therefore, on the night of October 18th, mobs attack, sack and burn supermarket churches, the, the, the subway system, actually uh, local businesses in not only in Santiago where everything started, but also in the, in the whole country, even in small, um, small uh, places too, but mostly concentrated in, in mainly metro areas. This process got escalating, escalating up uh, through the days until in the night on November 12, military faci facilities were unsuccessfully attacked by mobs. And that basically was a wake up call for the whole political class. So in the night of November 18, there was a turning point where the whole political spectrum agreed a course of action to replace the constitution and after that point, not immediately, but there was clearly a turning point in the violence and everything started to calm down. So let me first start trying to argue that these riots were an unexpected uh, event. On the left-hand side, you see a figure of uh, Google Trends for uh, searches in Chile with the word protesta, which basically means demonstrations. And in the y-axis, you see that uh, there is a, a 100, which is the highest point in the sample that we are looking at. And uh, the blue line is the intensity of search. And you see, this is uh, daily, and you see that basically on the 10th, it started increasing, but basically there's a huge spike on the, sorry, this is monthly, I believe. This month is not daily. There is a huge spike in October 2019, coincidentally with the uh, what we call this this riots. And then after after that in November there is a, a decrease, and then the decrease quickly after that to become a relatively back to normal. On the on the right hand side you see the police reports uh, to the Home Office uh, Ministry for the word disorderness, which is the closest one to actual uh, riots. And here you see the total number of 
of reports that were being made also in a monthly frequency. And you see that typically they're pretty stable and pretty mild relative to the peak, which happens in basically in October and November to get back. Uh, if we will have more data here, you'll see getting back uh, to normal also very quickly. So these two, these two figures indicate to us are suggestive, they're not smoking gun, but they're suggestive of two things. First, the riots were a very uh, sharp event and quite relatively short lived. And second, uh, they were unexpected uh, from any sort of measure that we may have uh, available. Then I'm going to argue uh, that this riot, there was a quite a, a great deal of, geograph of geographical variation in the country and even in Santiago metropolitan area. So this picture tells you two things. One thing that is, is that uh, Chile is so low that it's very difficult to put all together in one slide. The second thing is that basically you see uh, the intensity of riots, either high red, orange, moderate, yellow, low, and green decrease of the stable for each uh, municipality, and you see that there's a kind of a big, big variation. There are some municipalities that are very long in places of Chile, not that much populated like here or here, but still you see that it was a kind of a widespread event. In this part of the country is where uh, most of the people live. That's why municipalities are smaller. And this is an example of that looking at Santiago. And you see again that there, there is a kind of a large uh, variation in the intensity of riots, even across uh, very close municipalities that are very close together, like uh, this ones or, or here or in, in some other places. Again, red is high, orange is moderate, yellow is low, green is decreased or stable. Now, let me move to the pricing data to describe a little bit the pricing data. So what we have is VAT invoices uh, we have the universe of VAT invoices in supermarkets, either issued by customers going to the supermarkets or doing or supermarkets buying from, uh, from suppliers from uh, January 1st in 2015 to the 31st of December in 2019. So we put together all this data and uh, we ran some filter just to clean some, some uh, goods that may not be sold too often. And we end up with a data set of about 22,000 uh, goods that are not all the same goods being uh, sold every day. And in average, we have about 3,500 uh, uh, goods sold every day. Uh, if, in case you're curious, during the riots, there was not much decrease in the number of daily goods that we observed, so that is pretty stable. We observed 58 different supermarkets, retailers, say, say that more broadly, from uh, 377 different actual stores located in 156 different municipalities out of 345 municipal total municipalities in the country. Most of these municipalities are basically not rural areas, small enough not to have a supermarket. So basically this uh, observations we have are mainly concentrated in cities, big cities, mid scale cities, and some small cities, but not very, very small. If I may ask, um, the fact that yeah. you don't observe all of, all of the local municipalities, does this have anything to do with selection due to the riots or is this somewhat random? It has to do, no, it ha doesn't have to do with selection during the riots, has more has to do with selection of VAT invoicing. So uh, you can, when you, in Chile, when you go to supermarkets, you could do, at, at the cashier, you're going to get asked whether you want uh, either of two types of uh, tax documents. One is that for regular customers, that is basically like a final sales. And another one is for like supposed to mean for intermediates, but basically everyone who own a firm, when they go to buy the grocery in the supermarket, they uh, ask to fill with one of these VAT invoicing because they can claim later on the, the VAT. So there are some places 
either they are not uh, big supermarkets, so they don't fall into this category, or there are not enough uh, customers with this privilege of uh, buying the grocery using the VAT invoicing. Okay, thanks. Then the, uh, we're going to filter out uh, discount prices by using like a Midigan Kiho filter, but adjusted to uh, only 10 days. And something great that we believe is great that we have of this data is that we have actual transactions, transaction by transaction. Therefore, we can construct daily data that we believe that is essential to capture uh, high frequency events like these riots that, uh, that we're focusing on in this paper, as opposed to other data that may be come in a weekly base or even monthly base. So also as a pre preliminary analysis, what I'm showing, uh, showing you here is, are the usual statistics of uh, pricing behavior uh, for our data set on a monthly level. And uh, the reason to do that is to be comparable to other data sets that have been used in some other places for those, some other purposes of pricing in particular some uh, in the US. And if you, if, if you are uh, familiar with this literature, you're gonna, not gonna get surprised by any of these numbers. So the median frequency of price changes is about 27.3%, uh, which is about the prices are sticky for about four months. The mean frequency is 30%, showing that there is a little bit of skewness in the, in the distribution. The fraction of uh, price of positive price changes is 53%, which is consistent with some low trend inflation as is in Chile, which is about two, 3%. Uh, the mean size of price changes that are positive is about 11.2%, a little bit higher than the mean size of uh, price changes that are negative, which is 9.6%. Uh, the, uh, the fraction of a small price changes computed as all price changes that have less than half of the uh, mean size of price changes is about 43.7%. Uh, uh, and as usual in this type of, of data set, there is a kind of a high kurtosis, which is 8.6%. We also done some uh, cleaning in the data, trying to get rid of very tiny price changes that may come from measurement error, stuff like that and uh, there is very little uh, effect on, on the kurtosis. So this is the main specification we, we run. There is one dependent variable that changes depend on exactly what we're looking at. I'm going to be more precise about that later. And we're going to add a dummy that we call the riots, which is a period identifier between October 18th, 2019 to November 17th, 2019. So we cover exactly one month from the point in which basically this demonstration got out of control and unexpectedly or very quickly, suddenly they got out of control and basically the whole country started uh, uh, with some very big um, uh, distress. And they last uh, until a couple of days later of this uh, agreement of the political class to find some course of action to, to uh, smooth out the, the situation. We, went, we put a, a bunch of controls. Among them control, there are the fixed effects, but I want to tell you a little bit specifically about the, the fixed effects. We're gonna have product fixed effects, year and quarter, monthly, uh, the, week of, the week of the month, whether the particular uh, day is a weekend or a holiday. And the dependent variable we're gonna look at are going to be something that we call grades, which is the whether uh, with a zero one, whether the given price got changed on that particular day or not. And the idea there is to capture the fraction of prices that change every day. And, uh, and also uh, making the distinction whether those are positive or negative. We're also going to look at the size of price changes in particular where this site price changes are going to be positive or, or negative. And we're also going to look at the fraction of a small price changes, also distinguishing whether they are positive or negative. And as if, again, if you are inside in the city theater, you may know that uh, in many models of 
uh, endogenous uh, nominal press utility, the fraction of the small press changes is kind of an important statistic. So this is result one. The breaks, so the share, or if you wish, the probability that a firm will change its prices in a particular day fall uh, in, the, in the episode of the riots. And in particular, this fall is pretty big. Is going from, we compute the marginal effect by uh, netting out the uh, fixed effects that we have. And, and we find that the share of prices changing every day after this netting out uh, uh, the fixed effects, they go down from 3.8% per day to 2.6%. So there's a relatively big increase in stickiness during this particular month of the riots. Similar uh, results we find when we split this into positive breaks and negative breaks. So for positive breaks, uh, uh, we have a decrease of from 2.1% uh, of frequency of, of this share of prices changing every day to 1.5, and then the negative from 1.7 to 0.2. So bottom line, we observe that the, during this riot episode, it seems to be an increase in the stickiness of prices for the supermarkets. The second key result is about the size of uh, price changes, we observe that increase. So on the one hand, we have the positive size of price changes that we see that they increase and in the marginal effect is 2.2%, which means that, again, netting out all the, um, the fixed effects, it, it means that the average size of, of positive price changes uh, go up from 14% to 16.2% and is significant. Uh, the previous result was also highly significant and 1%. Uh, and the, the mean negative changes also go up from 11 to 0.2% to 12.4. So we observe uh, that the condition in the price changes, there is an increase in the size for both positive price changes and negative price changes. Then we go and look at the fraction of a small press changes, and we observe that they decrease, but especially decrease for negative press change. So let me show you uh, the result. So a small press change, again, is defined as a price change of less than half of the average size of a price change. And we observe that they uh, go down by 6%, but a significant only of 5% in total. So it means that the, it goes down from 42% to 36% of the total number of price changes uh, in, the, uh, in the distribution, in the sample. And when we split it between positive and, and negative, we observe that basically the decrease in the positive is not significant. And the whole thing comes from the decrease in the negative and they goes down by quite a bit from about 20% of all price changes to about uh, 15%. Result four is that we find no significant effect on what we call replacement cost, which is the prices paid by the supermarket for the same goods that we are capturing that they are selling uh, to customers. And basically we repeat all the statistics that I showed you before, and basically nothing is, uh, nothing is significant. One question, and Mr. In your yep. pre and as a consequence of the previous statistic, is it right to conclude that somewhat you move, you get more extreme tails, and thereby you have higher means, low, lower fraction of small price changes, and so on? Yes. So we should we should uh, what we observe is that there is more dispersion of price changes during the riots. There, is, there are less price changes, but condition in a price change there is a more dispersion of price changes. Yes. The last uh, uh, key result I'm gonna show you today is that we find very little effect of the intensity of, of the geographical variation of the intensity of riots. And this result goes through to some other statistics. I'm going to show you only one in the sick of time. Uh, and we're going to show you the breaks. So our measurement of the stickiness, which is the fraction of prices 
that change uh, every day. And we observe that they go down in total, they used to go down by 1.2% for the whole sample. And then what we do is that we split the sample into four zones. This municipalities where there is a high intensity of radius according to our measures, the ones that are high, but not so high, the moderates and the one that is a decrease or a stable uh, intensity of, um, of uh, this word disorderness, which is our interpretation for, for rise, which is basically any type of criminal uh, delinquent act, criminal act uh, on uh, property, on public, uh, on, on public property or, or, or businesses. So in, for the red, it's basically the same number that we found for the, for the whole sample. And for the others, they, don't, they also don't change so much. Also, if we look at the statistical, uh, statistically, all of them, probably the yellow one is a little bit different, but all of them basically are, uh, are not statistically different uh, each other. Something I must say at this point uh, too, is that before summarizing the results, Something I must say is that this result are obtained with an uh, unbalanced panel. If we run a balanced panel, of course, the um, significance of results go down a little bit because we have less observations, less power, but all results that I, that I show you today go through. So just to summarize, we find that at the supermarket level, there is less price changes those price changes that change are actually larger, and that is true either for positive or negative price changes. And there is a smaller fraction of price changes, but going back to Rafael's question, is especially true for the negative small price changes. It's not, there is an increase in dispersion, but it's not even between positive and negative uh, uh, small price changes. Something that we find very interesting is that at the supplier level, we find no significant effect. And also that the, the local intensity of the riot seems not to matter much for the behavior of the supermarkets of the specific locations. There's a question in the chat. So yeah. I think you might uh, want to take a look. What might be driving the price changes? Is it the disruption of supply chains or the uncertainty about the riots? So this is a great question. We're working on the model to try to distinguish the, the reasons behind uh, the effects. So far, we have documented uh, what is going on, not the reasons behind them. Now, uh, something that we might say about that is that it doesn't seem that is the disruption of the supply chain so much, basically because supermarkets sell about the same goods even during the episode of the riots. And we observe that, uh, remember, we, we observe VAT invoices. So, which means that we observe actual transactions. And actual transactions are happening during the episodes of the riot. And the number of transactions and the number of goods uh, bought by the supermarket are about the same. So, there may be something going on there, but it, I don't, if you uh, force me to guess uh, right now, uh, I will conjecture that it's, it's not a first order effect. There's but, one more Q and A question. I'm sorry, if, but yes, you might, absolutely. Uh, do you know if the store if stores more affected by the riots cut opening hours and or cut employment? This could explain why they reduce the number of price changes. Say that, that again, please. Uh, do you know if stores more affected by the riots cut opening hours or cut employment? This could explain why they reduce the number of price changes. Okay, I'm not sure I, I mean, a priori, the result may go in, in both ways, I believe. And on the one hand, um, again, we don't, we don't observe a much decrease in the number of price of, of goods sold by the supermarket. And, uh, and in the, it's true there are some areas where the supermarkets got uh, more closed or closed earlier because of the intensity of the riots. But again, 
we find that the local intensity of the riders seems not to have a direct effect on the pricing behavior of, of the supermarkets. If you, believe, if you want to think while about this, the same kind of distress happened to the supermarket may have happened to customers. There may be some crazy behavior going for customers. And that means that supermarkets may actually change more than prices. I mean, it could go either way. We find that there is more stickiness and we find something that we find very interesting is that there is no effect on the supplier level for uh, the supermarket. Something great of this data, uh, even if there is a retailer that have many different stores, actually these VAT invoices are still at the, at, the, at the location level. So we observe supermarkets selling, not the whole change, but actually a given store making more orders to get yogurt, dairy products, et cetera. And also uh, customers buy into that particular uh, location. So hopefully that gets that covered. Thanks a lot, Anna. So I, I believe you're almost out of time. If you can wrap up in the last minute, that'd be terrific. Yes, this is my, my, my last slide. So this is a speculative so far, but what we learn, what we think we learn from this, uh, from this empirical results. First, it cannot be pure Calvo because the key feature of Calvo is that frequency should not react to shocks. And we observe frequency reacted to the rights. Second, it cannot be the pure random menu cost model because in the random menu, menu cost model, the, there is some Calvo-ness added to the model to take care of the small path changes. And we do observe the path changes react. From the lens of a menu cost model, if anything, we see that during the riot there is indicative of more selection. So on the one hand, there is more stickiness, more extensive margin. On the other hand, there is more, there is less stickiness coming from the intensive margin. The non-regional variation suggests not a current shock in the sense of something affecting demand or supply or the specific locations, but something going on first more broadly, more aggregate, and something more has to do with their perception. This, this is uh, reinforced by the result of supplier prices seems not to, uh, to react, so it cannot be a direct uh, uh, supply shock, and also allow us to as isolate something that seems to be going on at the level of the retailer and not at the level of the suppliers. And we have see two possible way to go, each with their own possible uh, uh, challenges. One is new shocks and menu cost model that could be on the first moment or second moments. We need to think a little bit about, about that. About second moments, it's hard to argue that a riot may be something good so, ha happening in the future. So we are a little bit reluctant of, about that, but we, we have to see. And also about rational attention models, putting attention away from pricing, but then we're gonna face the same type of challenges of these type of models trying to uh, uh, make sense of the small pair change. And that's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this excellent uh, presentation. I think, Zhang, you're the next. Uh, if you could uh, share your screen, that'd be terrific. Thank you for uh, putting together this very nice program. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, uh, in this last paper, uh, pandemic induced uncertainty and how it affects uh, automation and income inequality. Um, it's a joint work with my colleague, uh, Sylvain LeDuc uh, at the San Francisco Fed. So um, the COVID uh, recession um, actually elevated the uncertainty measures, all kinds of uncertainty measures. This figure shows the VIX chart, uh, VIX has spiked to levels well above the uh, previous financial crisis period. And it came down recently, but still remain elevated. And this uh, uh, makes us thinking, you know, um, how does this uh, uh, pandemic uncertainty uh, affects the future of work? You know, these uh, workers uh, are susceptible to health risks. If they go back to work, um, you know, firms have to deal with uh, all the uh, equipment, the sanitation environment, etc. And this might, uh, you know, make firms want to uh, change the mode of production instead of using 
contact incentive uh, workers, uh, they might want to switch to robots or automation. So, um, but on the other hand, uncertainty, uh, an increasing uncertainty is not really a good time for considering investment, including automation investment. So there, it's, it's really in general, not to, uh, such a clear cut answer. Uh, the pandemic induced uncertainty may have ambiguous effect on the incentive of uh, automation. And related to the automation issue, uh, we're also thinking about the uh, machine and uh, uh, worker comp skill complementarity. So if uh, only skilled workers uh, are complementary to automation equipment, then an increase in automation would probably benefit the skilled workers at the cost of unskilled, uh, raising skill premium and therefore income inequality. So this paper is about both automation and uh, in, uh, income inequality triggered by the pandemic uncertainty. And to assess this kind of uh, uh, GE effect, we need a model. Uh, so we consider a, a model with uh, uh, two types of intermediate goods, um, both used uh, to produce a final consumption good as a CES aggregate of the two, good, uh, two intermediate inputs. And uh, the two types of goods are produced either by unskilled workers uh, or by robot, a robot combined with skilled workers. So we interpret the robot as automation equipment in general. And uh, uh, we want to model the um, labor market carefully here um, to introduce automation decisions uh, so uh, first we want uh, some labor market search friction. So we assume that unskilled workers um, face uh, frictional labor market uh, uh, and the skilled workers just uh, uh, face uh, the spot labor market and uh, with a competitive wage. Uh, firms would uh, create vacancies, um, but uh, it's costly to do so. Uh, we do that, uh, uh, as I explained in a few slides in a model, um, this deviation from the standard textbook uh, uh, Diamond Mortensen Pizzeridis model uh, is important uh, to allow us to uh, model automation decisions. Um, and uh, uh, the final element of the model is that the uh, firms can automate an unfilled vacancy. So the vacancies are posted, they can be uh, uh, filled with the, an unskilled worker. If not, uh, then the firm draw a random cost of automation. If the cost is lower than the benefit, then the firm go ahead and adopt the robot and uh, take away that vacancy. Uh, so this automation decision would be endogenous. And from the model, we learn a few things. Um, one thing is not so new, uh, job uncertainty raises unemployment. Um, in earlier work, uh, Savannah and I have this uh, paper uh, showing that uncertainty reduces aggregate demand and also increases the option value uh, for firms uh, looking for workers because uh, in a search model, employment relations are long-term relations. Uh, it's uh, uh, subject to some exogenous separation. So once you lock in an employment relation, it's going to be long term. And when uncertainty is high, you want to wait. Um, and uh, in the model, uh, with automation, we find uh, two opposing effects uh, from job uncertainty on automation. This, uh, this channel is actually new. Uh, we haven't uh, looked into before. Um, on one hand, uncertainty is bad for automation. It reduces the net present value of any robots you adopt. So this is similar to the option value channel of the labor market. Uh, once you adopt the robot, it's not gonna go away. You're gonna use it to subject to some depreciation, but uh, it's a long-term relation. So in, in, uh, under uh, higher uncertainty, the option value rises, you wanna wait. The other effect from the job uncertainty is that workers' um, productivity are uncertain for the firms. Now it's probably a good time to consider robots. So there's a technology shifting effect from workers to uh, machines that uh, boost the incentive of automation. So these two effects are working in opposite directions, making the net effect ambiguous 
uh, and uh, uh, depending on uh, calibrated parameters and shocks. So with calibrated parameters, we find that uh, an increase in job uncertainty uh, initially reduces automation and then raises it persistently. And automation increases, labor productivity rises because you can produce more with the same number of workers. And the increase in automation also benefits skilled workers because the skill and uh, equipments are complementary. Uh, and it reduces the unskilled workers' wages because when the firm has the option to automate, uh, it uh, uh, effectively reduces workers, weakens workers' bargaining power in wage negotiations because the firm's outside option has increased. It can automate instead of using that worker. Uh, that threat of automation that we show in the earlier paper uh, effectively uh, depresses unskilled workers' wages. Uh, so uh, through the automation channel, job uncertainty can increase income inequality uh, and uh, reduce labor share. To uh, make these arguments in uh, uh, some context, uh, uh, I'm going to show you a few uh, equations uh, with model specified. So as I said, there are two types of uh, workers, skilled and unskilled. They all live in the same representative family. Uh, there's a limited supply, a fixed supply of skilled workers. Um, and uh, uh, unskilled workers, there are two types, employed with measure N, unemployed with measure one minus N. Uh, and uh, the household faces utility function, uh, value consumption, and uh, uh, doesn't like uh, uh, working. So that's a uh, uh, value of leisure. And uh, there are uh, two types of three, three sources of labor income for the household family. One is uh, uh, the uh, working unskilled worker at wage WN and uh, the skilled worker uh, at wage WS. They also receive labor income and the unemployed fraction one minus N of unskilled worker receive unemployment insurance benefit fee. And in addition, they uh, uh, have, uh, uh, they receive dividends from the firm D and they pay taxes to the government and they have savings B. And uh, they, uh, the household use this uh, uh, source of income to finance consumption saving. Um, and you can derive the employment surplus uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, straightforwardly. Uh, I'm gonna uh, skip this. So in the labor market, there are two, uh, uh, two groups of people, uh, uh, two sides of the labor market. One is the job seekers, there are UT of them. In the beginning of the period, uh, there's a, a NT minus one employed workers, uh, delta fraction of them lose jobs. So one minus delta of them still have jobs and the labor force size is one. So the difference is uh, those uh, workers, uh, unskilled workers who don't have jobs. So they're looking for jobs. And the other side of labor market is vacancies. Firms create vacancies. Uh, a to T is a newly created vacancy subject to some cost, I explain. And another source of vacancies is the uh, uh, separated worker, delta times N. Um, and uh, 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 when the workers lose their jobs, they vacate the position. Uh, so the vacancy goes back to the stock of vacancy. And the third source of uh, vacancy is the unfilled vacancy from last period where QV is the job filling rate. So one minus QV times VT minus one is the number of unfilled vacancy. But what's new here is the automation probability QA. A fraction QA of the unfilled vacancy will be automated subject to some cost. Once a firm decides to automate those uh, job positions, the vacancies taken offline. Uh, they're not uh, no longer available for hiring workers. So after all this automation decision, the unfilled vacancy goes back to the stock of vacancy V. Uh, having this law of motion for vacancy uh, actually uh, uh, is uh, uh, helpful to generate realistic uh, dynamics, persistent dynamics of vacancy, unlike the DMP model where vacancy is a jump variable. And uh, uh, there's a matching technology combining the job seekers and the vacancies uh, through this Cobb Douglas function uh, to produce M uh, number of uh, new hires. So employment dynamics uh, uh, is just counting, accounting 
is a new hire, there's un, uh, separated workers, and end of period unemployment rate is just one minus n. QV is job fitting rate, QU is job finding rate. Those are very standard. So let me go to the automation decision now. There are two types of goods, uh, intermediate goods producers. One just operate with an unskilled worker, one firm, one, one worker with productivity ZT times Zeta LT. Z is the TFP, Zeta L is the worker specific productivity. And the other type of intermediate goods can be produced using one robot along with ST skilled workers. So that's a, a YAT, the second type of intermediate goods. Again, Z is a TFP, Zeta A is the automation specific technology and the ST is a number of skilled workers. When you aggregate this uh, across farms, there are N employ, uh, employed workers. So there are N farms uh, using un unskilled workers and aggregate intermediate goods is just the uh, whatever each farm produces times N. And uh, similarly for the uh, automation technology, uh, the, the goods produced using uh, robots, there are AT minus one available robots in each period at, uh, at the beginning of period. So the farm, uh, just there are 80 minus one of them. And S bar is just the total supply of skilled worker. And final consumption goods is a CES composite of these two types of intermediate goods with elasticity sigma. So now let me uh, talk about uh, two non-standard features of the model. Uh, one is uh, vacancy creation is costly. This is a deviation from the DMP model, one deviation. We assume that uh, there's a entry cost E, the firm needs to draw this uh, entry cost uh, before it decides whether or not to create a vacancy. E uh, is drawn from the distribution FE. Uh, there's a benefit of the vacancy uh, JV, uh, which is endogenous, I'll specify uh, in the next uh, couple of slides. If they realize the cost of creating that vacancy E is uh, no greater than JV, then there's a net benefit of creating that vacancy. The firm will go ahead and create it. And uh, uh, the number of uh, new vacancy being created would be just the CDF uh, of F, the function F, uh, at the indifference point JV. So eta is the number of new vacancy, F of JV is the CDF. We model the automation decision in a similar way. Uh, somehow it's kind of symmetric. This is a second non-standard feature of the model. If the firm wants to adopt the robot, it needs to pay a cost X. It's drawn from some distribution G. The value of that robot, the present value is that uh, it consists of this undepreciated uh, uh, discounted future income stream, where the income stream come from uh, the profit, uh, which is revenue minus an, a flow uh, operating cost kappa A. And then there's a continuation value JA, T plus one. Uh, row O is the obsolescence rate of the robot. And uh, the firm would automate if and only if the cost of adopting a robot is less than or equal to a critical point or indifference point X star. The X star is given by the value of the robot minus whatever the firm is giving up. Remember I, I mentioned once the firm decide to automate a non-field vacancy, that vacancy is taken offline. It's no longer available to the firm. So the firm is foregoing JV, the value of vacancy. The net benefit of uh, uh, automating would be JA minus JV. And the probability of automation would be just uh, the CDF at the indifference point X star. QA is the probability of automation. So given these conditions, then the stock of robots or automatons A uh, would evolve according to this law of motion in the last equation. Uh, there's a fraction row O gets depleted every period uh, or obs obsolete, the robots become obsolete. And the, the, the last term would are just, is is just the newly adopted robot. It's QA, the probability of robot adoption times the number of available uh, vacancies, unfilled vacancies from last period. So the value of a vacancy 
uh, would, uh, would be whatever the firm needs to pay uh, Kappa uh, for posting a vacancy, uh, hoping to find a worker uh, in a match, match market. If the match is formed with probability QV, the firm finds a worker, unskilled worker, the firm obtains the employment value JE. If the match uh, is not formed with probability one minus QV, then the vacancy gets carried over to next period. And with, uh, in the beginning of next period, there's a probability QA, the vacancy gets automated. The firm obtains JA. Uh, with one minus QA probability, the vacancy remains vacant. Um, so the firm obtained JVT plus one. And uh, uh, if the firm finds a worker, unskilled worker, then uh, it obtains the employment value JE, uh, which equals the flow profit, um, the revenue minus the wage, uh, plus the discounted uh, continuation value. Uh, either the position remains or separated uh, with probability delta, in which case the firm ob obtains the vacancy value. So, uh, Unskilled wages are determined by Nash bargaining. This employment surplus that the household obtains if uh, the, an unskilled worker is employed, and there's the surplus obtained by the firm uh, if it hires a worker. Remember, the uh, uh, firm has the option of keeping the vacancy uh, open. Uh, if it hires a worker, it obtains JE, but it gives up JV. So the net uh, surplus for the firm is JE minus JV. B is the bargaining weight for workers. So you can easily uh, solve this steady state wage, Nash bargaining wage. And uh, this expression reveals uh, some uh, useful uh, information. One is that uh, Nash bargaining wage increases with workers reservation value, which is this utility plus UI benefit. Uh, and it also increases with the workers bargaining weight B. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Nash bargaining wage decreases with the firm's reservation value JV uh, uh, that, uh, since JV enters negatively in the expression for the wage. And the threat of automation represented by the probability of automation QA, it, it doesn't have to be a realized automation. It's just the probability of automation QA. It would raise JV because the firm would have, the, uh, have a higher option uh, to uh, uh, automate the vacancy instead of uh, uh, keeping it to hire workers. That's going to lower workers' wage because uh, the firm has outside a higher outside option. And skilled wage is de just determined by the marginal product of skilled workers. And here's the uh, market clearing condition. I'm not going to have time to do this. So uh, there's a lots of information here, but a lot of them are standard. Uh, just focus on the two expressions for the cost function, the vacancy creation cost F and the robot adoption cost distribution G. Uh, we assume uh, normal distribution for simplicity uh, and we need to calibrate the scale parameters E bar and X bar. Uh, and there are a few other parameters uh, we basically uh, uh, calibrated according to our uh, other paper in 2019, uh, plus some additional parameters uh, related to scale premium. Um, and uh, uh, what's key here is uh, we focus on job uncertainty shock. What is the job uncertainty? Uh, here is the labor specific productivity, uh, Zeta L. And uh, the first moment, Zeta L has a first moment shock, uh, which is AR1 with persistent 0.95. Standard is a, got time varying volatility, sigma Zeta. And uh, there's a second moment shock, sigma Zeta. Uh, we calibrate according to our JME paper, we estimated uh, there. Um, so 0.76 is persistence, 0.39 standard deviation of second moment shock. So we focus on second moment shock. Here's the impulse responses, impulse responses to a, a second moment shock to labor specific productivity, the sigma zeta shock. It is contractionary. Um, by the way, we don't have any sticky prices. So this is, uh, uh, this is interesting and important uh, because uh, uh, the unemployment vacancy responses are sizable. Uh, 
Uh, in standard uh, spot labor market model, like RBC model, you're not going to get this. You're going to get an expansionary effect from uncertainty because of precautionary saving. Here, we have this option value channel where employment relations, long-term relations. So uh, you get a contractionary effect on unemployment, vacancy goes down. Automation probability initially declines, reflecting the recessionary effect and the subsequently rises persistently. And uh, uh, this reflects the other effect, the technology shift effect. I'll explain in the next slide. And when automation rises persistently, labor productivity goes up and the uh, automation uh, threat depressed the unskilled wage, but the increasing uh, robots will raise the skill premium. Uh, and uh, uh, despite the increase in the skilled workers' income, labor share, which is the total wage income divided by the uh, value added uh, is still going down and aggregate output declines. How sensitive are these impulse responses to the assumptions we make about how you calibrate the, the automation related parameters? You had some in your calibration with some scale and so on. Yes, uh, the calibration is, uh, as I mentioned, it's just borrowed from our earlier work uh, in the robot paper. Uh, for the skill, uh, for the uh, elasticity and uh, the uh, uh, you know the technology uh, using automation and skilled workers, we calibrate to match the steady state skill premium. Um, so we have not really looked into the sensitivity uh, because this is very preliminary. We will probably do some of those. So I can't answer your question at this point. Because you might think there's a lot of uncertainty, right? How this, this, how some of these, how the, how the economy will look like, right? And, yeah. and but the but the two opposing effect on automation uh, is very robust. We have checked with sticky price or without, uh, and uh, uh, with the physical capital investment or without, they're fairly robust. Absolutely, I let you go on. For the, yeah. so thanks so much. Sure. So, so as I explained, you know, there's two opposing effect uh, is uh, uh, reflecting one is recessionary effect that discouraging investment in automation, uh, JA, the value of automation falls. And the other is a technology substitution effect uh, because the opportunity cost of automation also declines when uncertainty is high. JV, the value of vacancy uh, declines. So the probability of automation depends on the difference between JA and JV. So when JA falls, JV also falls, this uh, creating two opposing effects. Um, I, have, I have gone through all this. Um, so the last couple of minutes, I'll just show you some uh, 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 corroborative VR evidence. Uh, here's a, a chart that shows uh, the uh, VR uh, impulse responses to uh, an uncertainty shock, where uncertainty is measured by the Michigan Surveys Consumer Uncertainty, as in our GME paper. But uh, you could use VIX or EPU, it's going to get the same. What's surprising is uh, an increase in uncertainty is recessionary. Okay, that's that's old news. Unemployment rises, inflation falls as demand declines, interest rate declines, but it raises the share of investment in computer and the peripherals. This computer share increase is surprising. And that reflects the automation channel. Uh, although we don't directly have the um, a, a good measure of automation investment, but these computer and peripherals are broadly related to the equipment uh, concept in the model. And also as a model predicts, the same uncertainty shock that generates a recession generates a reduction in a labor share uh, because uh, automation rises, it depresses the unskilled wages and uh, boosts the skill premium, but overall the labor share declines. So this seemed to uh, lend us a little bit more confidence about the model mechanism. And with that, I'm going to uh, just wrap up. Uh, we looked at the pandemic induced job uncertainty, how that uncertainty affects uh, employment, automation, and the income distribution. Uh, we argue that uh, the job uncertainty uh, that uh, you know, uh, raised the uncertainty about worker productivity might stimulate automation and the increase the scale premium. Uh, and uh, uh, this model mechanism seem to be broadly consistent with the VR evidence. I'll stop there. 
thank you so much. I believe we're out of time, uh, but if, if we, I guess we're out of time. So yeah, there was one question in the chat, um, but I, I think uh, we're good. So um, if you, I, I don't know if you still broadcast. So if you can answer the question, if you'd like to take a minute just to, to answer this. Um, the question reads, what's the difference between a productivity shock and a job uncertainty shock? Um, but well, uh, one is a first moment shock, the productivity, if I understand correctly, and the other is second moment shock. Uh, I'm not sure if that's oversimplifying, but uh... Some, sounds good to me. Um, and I'm uncertain about this technology here. So um, I, I believe we're done. So thank you, everybody, very much for uh, making it on a Sunday for some very early, for some very late. Um, and uh, those were excellent presentations. So I hope we meet again soon in person. Thank you, uh, Rafael. Yeah, have, stay safe and uh, see you soon. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Rafael. Bye. 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 -bye.